my lab uses the Nematode C. elegans. It is a worm and it is very small. It is about the size of a comma in a sentence. And C. elegans is the only animal for which we know the connectivity, the wiring, the architecture of the whole nervous system. It's also the only animal for which we know the identity of every single cell. We know that it has exactly 959 cells. We know that 302 of those are neurons. Uh, we know the position. We know the synapses. We know where they're supposed to form. And we like using the animal because it's transparent. And the transparency allows us to visualize, to image, specific uh, tissues like the synaptic connections that are important for the study that we did. Much like in a computer, if you hit the letter T, you're expecting to see the letter T in the monitor. And the reason that works properly is because the circuits in the keyboard are precisely connected to the circuits of the monitor. Our own brains, the circuits have to be precisely connected for us to be able to perceive information, integrate it, and execute the correct behaviors. When our circuits are not precisely connected, that can lead to all sorts of uh, neurological problems. So most of our previous work has focused on how the architecture of the nervous system forms in the animal. And both our studies and other people's studies have shown that the animal, C. elegans and other animals, spend a lot of resources in instructing the correct connectivity by instructing the position of the synapses in very specific places. After the animals are born, they grow in size. So we became interested in understanding how is it that that architecture is preserved as the animals are increasing in size. This work was done by postdoctoral fellow Si Young Chao and also Ryan Christensen in collaboration with the lab of Eric Jorgensen at University of Utah and Shigeki Watanabe, who was who's a graduate student at University of Utah. The part of the worm that we're looking at is denoted by the small dashed box. You can see the cartoon diagram up here. We're looking at three uh, tissues in particular. One of these tissues is a skin cell. You'll see it appear here on purple. The other is a glial cell, which is a sort of support cell for neurons. And then finally, we have the neurons themselves, as shown in uh, gray here. The small green dots are cartoon representation of connection between the neuron we're looking at and then other neurons which I have not shown in the cartoon. So one of the important concepts that comes out of this study is that the glia is acting as a guidepost, not in the development of the synapse, but actually in the maintenance of the position of the synapse in this particular paradigm. In a normal animal, uh, you can see that the animal will get larger as it grows, but despite the fact that all the parts of the animal are getting larger, the uh, relationships between the various parts of the animal do not change. So the pattern of connections you see here and the relation of the neuron to the support cell and the support cell to the skin cell stay roughly the same in relation to each other, even though the whole thing is getting much larger. So we did a genetic study in C. elegans to discover what molecules are required for the maintenance of synaptic positions as the animal is growing. We found a mutation in a gene which caused a changes in the relationships between these three cells. So when you lose this gene called SEMA1, um, you'll notice that as the animal is getting bigger, the glia is getting disproportionately larger in comparison to the neuron and to the um, skin cell. And as a result of this, as the glia is getting larger, you're actually forming new synapses between the neuron and some unknown partner neurons. The interaction between the epidermal cell and the glia is actually mediated by the FGF receptor, which is an important signaling molecule. But this interaction is actually through a novel role of the FGF receptor that's only dependent on its extracellular domain. We also discovered that the FGF receptor is being regulated in the epidermal cell through a lysosomal localized transporter, which is novel, and which we call CIMA1 for circuit maintenance one. CIMA1 is similar to a gene in humans called cyanine, 
that when mutated results in neurological disorders and disease. This role of the glia being a mediator is actually reminiscent of what is seen in other tissues in the vertebrates, such as, for example, the blood-brain barrier. So in the blood-brain barrier, glia cells such as astrocytes can translate functional information from the synapses in the neurons to the endodermal cells in the capillaries to mediate blood flow. We also know that glia is important in the development of the nervous system and that that is tightly linked to the vasculature in our own brains. So we, uh, although we don't have evidence for this, we think that it will be interesting based on the findings that we have in C. elegans to see if structures such as the glia interaction between the endodermal cell and the synapse in the blood-brain barrier is actually conserved and important for maintaining the position of synapses as animals grow.